What do you think of when I say continuous delivery? Lots of people think that this means automatically pushing change into production on every commit. But in general, in, in continuous delivery circles, this is something different. But closely related, that we usually refer to as continuous deployment. So what are the differences between continuous delivery and continuous deployment? And when should you choose one over the other? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to start as usual by thanking our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They support our channel, so please do support them by checking their links in the description below in return. If you'd like to learn more about continuous delivery and optimizing for either continuous delivery or continuous deployment, I recommend my book, Continuous Delivery Pipelines, which describes in some detail how to create effective continuous delivery pipelines that will in turn help you deliver better software faster. I get lots of great comments to my videos here on all sorts of topics, but one of the most popular comments is that people rather like my t-shirts. So we thought it would be rather fun to reach out to the company that I buy most of my shirts from. And so they've kindly agreed to offer a special deal for viewers of the Continuous Delivery channel. So if you like any of my t-shirts, check out the link in the description below for a significant discount. A long time ago now, I wrote a book called Continuous Delivery with my friend Jez Humble. In it, Jez and I described some stuff that we learnt about how to extend the reach of continuous integration and through the use of an idea that we called deployment pipelines, how we could optimise our development approach to give us great feedback as we made progress. This also meant that we could significantly improve the repeatability and reliability of our releases through automation. When we wrote our book, we both thought that we had some useful ideas to share. We'd been practicing this approach for some time in several different projects, so we knew how well these ideas worked. I recall having a conversation with Jez before the book was launched at one point, and one of us saying, I think we've got a methodology here, but we were both rather nervous of making such a grand claim out loud. As a result, we consciously focused our book primarily on the practicalities of reliable software releases through build, test and deployment automation. Even though we both knew that there was more to it than only the, te the technology. That formed the basis for one of the first common misinterpretations of continuous delivery. That it's just about build and deployment automation. Even in the subtitle of the book, uh, it's a fair bit more than that. A cornerstone of the book, for example, is on the focus of test automation as well as build and deployment. I think of continuous delivery as a kind of second generation extreme programming approach, firmly grounded in the techniques of test driven development. The other common misunderstanding though is perhaps a bit more understandable. Most people assume that continuous delivery means pushing change into production all of the time. One of the common pushbacks that I often get is my users don't want change all of the time. This is understandable because the approach is, after all, called continuous delivery. But it doesn't really mean that we must push our changes into production all of the time. Our aim is to continuously deliver. But there are several different parts to the value that this approach unlocks. So we've found that it's useful to tease these different values apart and think about them separately even though they're very closely related. As a result, in continuous delivery terminology, we differentiate between two closely related practices, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Continuous delivery is working so that our software is always in a releasable state. These things that we are continuously delivering are really release candidates, not necessarily releases. Continuous deployment is a subset of continuous delivery. In continuous deployment, if all of our tests pass, we make the decision to release the change automatically. When all our tests pass, we deploy the change straight into production. I think it's helpful to look at these two ideas as being somewhat distinct. 
There are many circumstances, wrongly or rightly, where our decision to release is constrained in some way. But that doesn't mean that continuous delivery is not valuable. In fact, quite the reverse. Continuous deployment is the natural conclusion of continuous delivery and where possible I very strongly recommend it. But there are some business contexts where it doesn't make sense or at least it's not practically an option. The traditional approach to planning software release is to aim to deliver on a certain target date and then everyone aims to organise their work so that the software will be ready for that date. This may take the form of making sure that all the features that you need are ready, or it may be making sure that all the testing has been done for the features by that time. This is still the most common way to organise things as far as I can see. How far off the target date is may vary, but fundamentally whether your target date is two years out in some waterfall plan, two months out in some safe release train, or two weeks out as a spring goal doesn't really make any difference. In each case, the team organises its work to be ready at the target time. Continuous delivery is really very different. In continuous delivery, our aim is to work so that our code is always releasable, all of the time. It doesn't matter whether we've got a target date or not. After every successful commit, our system is ready for release. This approach has lots of advantages. Working to a target date is a bit like leaving your studying before a big exam until the night before, which I was certainly guilty of, but it's never the best way to get a good result. The continuous delivery approach means that we can always hit a date. We just can't necessarily promise to deliver a specific collection of features by a certain date. But we can always deliver whatever it is that we have by that time. What this means is that there is essentially, from a business perspective, no latency involved in releasing things. That results from technical constraints anyway. Even if the business decision is that usually we're going to release every week, if we change our minds for any reason, there's nothing that prevents us from releasing whenever it makes sense. We've moved the decision to release firmly to where it belongs. It's a business decision, not a technical one. Even so, there are still significant technical advantages to working in a continuous delivery way that are available to us even before we start thinking about the extra advantages that continuous deployment brings. Continuous delivery gives us the clearest, most definitive feedback on our changes that we can possibly get, short of knowing that our users find them valuable, that is. The standard that we set is releasability. Is our change safe, ready to release? In continuous delivery, our deployment pipeline is definitive for release. If our pipeline passes, there's no more work to do before we're ready to release our change into production. That gives us a pretty clear definition of the level of confidence that we need to achieve. And it tells us what we need to test for in our deployment pipelines. That is, everything that determines the releasability of our changes. Does it work? Does it do something useful for its users? Is it fast enough, secure enough, resilient enough? Is it compliant with any relevant regulations? We'll automate testing for all of these things so that there's no more work left to do once the pipeline says our changes are good. If the pipeline says it's good, it's good to go. At the heart of continuous delivery is the idea of continuous integration. Part of the definition of continuous integration is that everyone on the team merges their changes together at least once per day. So the consequence of this for continuous delivery is that we're going to produce a releasable thing at least once a day. So that means that at least once per day we know if our software is releasable or not. If it's not, we fix it immediately because that's our highest priority, keeping our software releasable. This approach promotes working in very small steps. Actually, it's considerably more than just promotes it. It pretty much forces us to work in very small steps because we'll be committing at least once per day. Otherwise, it doesn't count as continuous delivery at all. After each small step, we'll check to see if our software is still releasable. Working in these tiny steps means that each change is simpler. After, after all, there's less code in each change. 
That means it's easier to think about, easier to spot mistakes, and if something does go wrong, it's easier to revert the change and think again. Small, simple changes are smaller and simpler to release. There's very little fixed overhead to changes in this approach, so there's a much lower barrier to trying out ideas or applying quick fixes to problems. I don't know of any other approach that comes even close to delivering the clarity and quality of continuous delivery. But notice, in all of that description, I've said almost nothing about the actual release into production. I can get all of these benefits by working so that my software is always ready for release, even if I don't actually release it. So, if I'm working on a medical device where I'm not allowed to release it into production until it's been, the change has been reviewed by an external independent third party for six months, or if I'm building a financial exchange where I'm not allowed to release a change to real users until there's a minimal feature set available as specified by my regulators, then even here in these tricky cases, I can still practice continuous delivery. Continuous delivery gives us the clearest, best feedback on whether we're building things right. So where does continuous deployment come in? Well, there are two things that we can't get from continuous delivery alone. The first is clear feedback on whether or not we're building the right things. However perfect our feedback mechanisms, however high the quality of our code, it's irrelevant if the software we're building is never used by anyone. Our job is not to build great code. Our job is to build software that's useful or fun for people to use. If the people don't like it, we failed. So as well as determining if it looks releasable to us, the producers, we also have to check that it's useful to our users, its consumers. So for that, we need to get it into their hands. Continuous delivery is fantastic for developers and dev teams, but it's also fantastic for the organizations that create software because it gives them the chance to work experimentally and to learn what works for their users. To do that, you want to gather lots of feedback from them and gather it frequently. Working in isolation is not really the route to great products. If you don't listen to your customers, you aren't likely to know what it is that they want. Developing world-class products is about learning about customer needs and finding ways to satisfy them. To do that, you need to experiment with your ideas and find out ways to try them out. Delivering working software to customers and seeing what they make of it is one of the most important strategies to achieve this. If you spend a couple of years building a big complex product and then release it to the world, how do you know why it succeeded or failed? There are so many changes in such a product. How can you tell which ones your users loved and which ones are duds? If we could release our changes in smaller pieces, smaller steps, it would be easier to see which step was good and which one was bad. It'd be easier to change our minds and step back from the bad ones and, not, and do more of the good ones. So releasing change more frequently gives us a lot more options for control. We control the variables in our product releases, and so it's much easier to see what works and what doesn't. And then we can react more quickly to either success or failure. So if continuous delivery allows us to see if we are building things right, continuous deployment lets us see if we're building the right things. But there's another, maybe even more subtle advantage to continuous deployment. This one is probably a bit more counterintuitive. Releasing change more frequently is the lower risk strategy. I think it's fair to say that this sounds wrong. If we think of safety critical systems, we're used to thinking of people taking great care and probably also dealing with quite a lot of layers of bureaucracy. What this means is that the bureaucracy adds an overhead. It, if it takes you a month to do the testing and the paperwork for a release, you're obviously not going to be releasing every day. So now we're forced to release change in bigger chunks instead of the small, frequent, simple releases of continuous delivery. Now we have big, infrequent, complex releases instead. This means that the difference between versions is much bigger. And so there is more chance of there being a problem with any given upgrade between releases. 
It's also more difficult to spot problems. And when you do find a problem, it's more difficult to find what caused it. So we'll spend a lot more time in diagnosis. Once we've figured out what is wrong, it's more difficult to disentangle the broken stuff from the good stuff. The result of all of this is that, as I said, counterintuitively, going slow has a big cost on quality. In one of the more amusing findings from the DORA group, common approaches to safety and regulation, like for example change approval boards, are actually negatively correlated with quality. That is, the more procedures that you put in place to check that your system is good, the slower you go, so the batch size of your changes go up, the worse your system will score on measures of stability and throughput. And stability is a measure of the quality of our work. So poor scores means your code will break more and it will take you longer to fix it when it does. This is counterintuitive and scary if you spent much of your career working on these sorts of systems and applying these sorts of bureaucratic controls. But actually, once it's pointed out, it kind of makes sense. Mistakes in any system can always happen, but they're much more likely to happen when the systems are big and complex. In these systems, there are more places for mistakes to hide. I rationalise it like this, however we organise our work, we can think of it as a collection of changes. Each change carries with it a certain amount of risk that this change adds a new problem. So the total amount of risk in a release um, that there is any problem is given, going to be the sum of all of these little risks. But then there's another type of risk, the risk that two or more of these changes interact with each other in some unexpected and probably unpleasant way. This risk will be some sort of exponential function because the more changes we have, the greater the chance that two, two or more of them will interact in bad ways. So a calculation of the total risk associated with any release is going to be the sum of all of the risks for each change, plus the risk that two or more changes clash in some way. So if we want to reduce the risk, we can take care with each change, sure, and reduce the risk associated with it. But even more powerfully, we can reduce the number of changes that take place in any given release, simplifying the delta between releases. We can work in smaller, simpler steps. Many smaller, simpler changes are much less risky than fewer, bigger, more complex changes. Small, fast and simple is the higher quality, safer approach. So if we want to do a good job of releasing safer software, we should release more often, not less. Thank you very much for watching.